I've been a physician assistant for 10 years. My background includes emergency medicine and spine and sports medicine. On December 6th of 2018, I woke up and I was numb from the waist down. That day it was just, I couldn't feel my legs at all. So I went to work, called one of my colleagues and he told me to go right to the hospital. When I was first diagnosed, it was terrifying because the doctor said to me, well, if you don't, if you don't start these medicines, you're gonna be dead blind or in a wheelchair within five years. There's really no words to explain how being diagnosed with two and then eventually a third rare neuroautoimmune disease, uh, the effect that that has on someone. I am an extremely independent person. I am an extremely positive person. I'm a single mom to two kids, two great deans, and uh, I'm always on the go. So to have been paralyzed from the waist down was um, humbling at the very least, and uh, it was scary. It was a very scary experience to not know what the future hold. It was, uh, it was terrifying. I think that having a medical background uh, helps me to be an advocate for patients with rare disease because it helps me to act as almost a liaison or, or even a translator between doctors and their patients. And from there, kind of just snowball. Like, you know, I'd really like to open this IV therapy place uh, to really focus on functional medicine and how to help people feel better. So as the idea grew and I talked to more people about it, they were like, this is fantastic. And uh, it kind of just further inspired me to keep going. I heard about the Rear Risk Scholarship on one of my Facebook groups for Neuromyelitis Optica. I was at that time and still doing my MBA in business uh, because I wanted to open the functional medicine practice. But I have the background in medicine for over 10 years now. I have the patient experience for three years now, but I don't have much business experience. But as a single parent with two kids, sometimes it's a little scary taking on additional um, uh, financial obligations like school for myself. So I heard about the scholarship and was really excited about it. I applied and was uh, uh, very, very delighted to hear that I had won the scholarship. It's really helping me to learn what I need to do to run a successful practice and be able to reach the most patients as possible. And I'm happy to say that in October of 2021, I opened Revive, my IV therapy and holistic medicine practice. While you know, I wish this disease never happened to me or to anybody else, we don't have to be victims of our illnesses. We can decide our fate or our destiny once we decide to understand, to learn about it, and we can really use that to even help other people. Hello, Rare Disease Week participants uh, and other attendees. Thanks for being here today. My name is Kate Tai, and I have the privilege of being head of US Public Affairs and Patient Advocacy for Rare Diseases at Sanofi. A very heartfelt thank you to Every Life Foundation for Rare Diseases for the opportunity to moderate today's discussion. I always love the chance to be with uh, folks talking about newborn screening, which is one of my favorite topics. I would also like to thank the Rare Disease Caucus co-chairs, Senators Amy Klobuchar and Roger Wicker, and Representatives Gus Rackus and George Butterfield. Your leadership and advocacy to support the rare disease community truly matters and is deeply appreciated. Over the past few days, the level of engagement, excitement, and education that I have seen around ensuring the patient voice is part of policymaking process has been incredible. It's just talking with our panelists about how inspired I have been to hear from all of you. It is essential that the needs of the rare disease community remain front and center when decisions are being made that impact you, drug development, sustainable access, and choice for care. I'm grateful to you for spending the time and energy to learn about important issues that are on the table, and most importantly, for taking time to get involved. The purpose of today's session is to highlight the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Reauthorization Act, uh, which allows the Health Resources and Services Administration, or HRSA, to spearhead the creation of federal recommendations on newborn screening, as well as assist states and programs to meet those requirements. We're privileged to hear about this important legislation today, as well as to have an overview of the results of the newborn screening modernization study and gain insights into the impact that modernization would have on newborn screening programs to sustain them for the future. As we know, newborn screening is a vital program in our public health care system. Early, accurate diagnosis at any stage of life 
makes a difference to patients and their families. Thank you for being with me for today's discussion to talk about how newborn screening can improve diagnosis and improve outcomes. Over the course of the next hour, we have the opportunity to hear from thought leaders about barriers and potential solutions to improving diagnosis, and I'm grateful to my fellow panelists for joining me today. We have Dylan Simon, who's Associate Director of Policy at the Every Life Foundation for Rare Diseases. He's going to present on the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Reauthorization Act, the CDC, HRSA, and NIH sections, the purpose of the bill, and the urgency to pass this bill. Although Dylan, you might not be tired of talking about it yet. I would love for the day when you're not here to tell us about why we should reauthorize it. Uh, Garrett Devinney is a staffer from the Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions. Some of you might hear it called HELP. He's going to provide information on the National Academy, National Academy, Academy Newborn Screening Modernization Study within the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Act the status of the Reauthorization Act and the outlook for 2022. Mike Hu is a parent of a child living with MPS and co-founder of Project Guardian. He's a newborn screening advocate and is going to speak on the patient experience on newborn screening and how passage of the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Act will improve the newborn screening system. Don Bailey, a PhD and Master's of Education, is a distinguished fellow from RTI International. He's going to provide an overview as well as the results from the Newborn Screening Modernization Study. This first of its kind study, led by a coalition of rare disease organizations, evaluates the opportunities and challenges facing the US newborn screening system and presents a suite of proposals for modernization from a cross section of experts. And Dylan, I will hand it over to you. Great, uh, thanks so much, Kate. Uh, and thank you for everybody being here today. Uh, as Kate said, I'm going to speak um, some high level about the purpose and the urgency of the bill and then go into some of the sections of the, of the legislation. Uh, and so as many uh, on this call are probably well aware, newborn screening uh, is generally regarded as one of the most successful public health programs uh, in the country. Uh, and that, that ability to provide early diagnosis uh, allows for early treatment uh, because at the end of the day, newborn screening saves lives. Uh, and so the purpose of this legislation is really to make a needed improvements across the federal newborn screening system. Uh, and so with the original passage in 2008, uh, we've seen continued progress within the federal program, uh, both in scope as well as their support to the states uh, in, in running their own uh, newborn screening programs. Uh, and so it's really important to make these updates. Uh, and, and often uh, you'll hear a question around, uh, why do we need this passed? Uh, especially because uh, the programs have officially been lapsed uh, since September of 2019, uh, but these programs continue to be funded uh, and, and do continue uh, to move forward. Uh, so a common question is, why do we need this reauthorization? Uh, and it's important to note that the reauthorization comes with vital improvements. And so while, yes, the status quo uh, is in place, uh, and we're, we're happy the fact that the programs are still functioning and still going, uh, there are important updates within the newborn screening reauthorization that will help to grow uh, the newborn screening system and ensure the fact that it remains one of the most successful public health programs uh, in the country. Uh, and some of those you can see within uh, the section I'm about to talk about. Uh, and so first, uh, within NIH, uh, it would really help to continue to support rare disease research uh, and really uh, support the Hunter Kelly, uh, rare, Hunter Kelly Research Program, uh, which is specifically for newborn screening, uh, providing important funding uh, for newborn screening research, uh, ensuring the fact that we can not only continue to better understand uh, the status of conditions that are currently on panels, but helping to grow research to uh, for conditions to be added to newborn screening panels. Um, following that uh, within HRSA, uh, there, there are two main roles within HRSA. Uh, so the first is gonna be the grants that they supply to the state. Uh, and so those tend to serve more educational purposes uh, in helping to develop education materials uh, for parents as well as physicians on, on the impact of conditions that are on newborn screening panels. Uh, but it's also important to note that within the reauthorization, you see vital improvements uh, such as ensuring the fact that these grants can be used to help in follow-up services. Uh, as I often speak about, uh, newborn screening is a system and not a test, uh, and a big part of the system is the follow-up service uh, to ensure the fact that those who have uh, a positive newborn screen can be brought in uh, for their confirmation testing. Uh, and this, within, this, within the reauthorization, it would ensure the fact that states can use these Hershey grant funds 
to make sure that less families are lost in that follow-up process of coming back in for confirmation testing. Um, the other part uh, that is her within HRSA is going to be the advisory committee for heraldic disorders and newborns and children, or the advisory committee, as we often refer to it as, uh, which oversees the recommended uniform screening panel, uh, which is the federal recommended panel uh, that is a guide for the states um, on what conditions they should be adding to their state panels. Uh, and there's important updates within the reauthorization uh, calling for the advisory committee uh, to increase their transparency uh, so that patient advocacy organizations that are preparing uh, their packages for cross nomination have a better understanding of, of what exactly is required uh, in their package. Uh, and, and lastly, within the CDC, the CDC plays a vital role with the state public health labs in, in helping to helping labs understand what exactly needs to be done for the testing uh, and ensuring the fact that there is a knowledge base uh, that the individual state labs can go to to ensure the fact that they know how to run these tests uh, and when a new condition is added that they have uh, the proper information just to begin screening. Uh, and an important update within the reauthorization is to better uh, help CDC uh, in their data collection so that they can work with the states to really identify some best practices through their data to really understand uh, what is working for individual state labs uh, and how they can best kind of disseminate that information of best practices. Um, and so again, the reauthorization will bring about really important changes uh, to the current uh, program to ensure the fact that it remains successful uh, and it continues uh, to provide that early diagnosis. Uh, and to talk a little bit more about uh, the National Academy study within the reauthorization as well as status of the legislation, uh, I will pass it over to Gary. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Um, as, as Dylan said, my name is Garrett Devinney. I am a health policy advisor on the health committee um, and, and handle newborn screening issues for Senator Murray, who's the, the current chair of the committee. Um, so in addition to the existing federal programs uh, related to newborn screening that Dylan just walked through, the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Act reauthorization uh, includes a really important provision related to a National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine report on modernizing the newborn screening program. So uh, the goal here is to build off the current work that these programs um, build off the current work of these programs and in the, in the work of states as well as hopefully lay the groundwork for future changes in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in legislation. So for example, this uh, National Academy's report would require an analysis of identifying factors that impact decisions to add new conditions to the RUSP, challenges posed by adding uh, newly nominated conditions, an analysis of barriers that states face in adding new conditions to their screening panels, an analysis of the current state of all federal and privately funded research related to newborn screening, an overview of technologies that would permit screening for new categories of disorders, technological and other infrastructure needs uh, among states and their newborn screening programs, as well as an analysis of the extent to which newborn screening yields better data on disease prevalence for screen conditions, as well as the impact uh, of newborn screening on newborn morbidity and mortality in states that have adopted tests included on the RUSP. So we really feel like this is a crucial component and is quite complementary to the updates that we are trying to secure that Dylan just walked through. Uh, in terms of the status of the legislation, so the, uh, this Congress, the House and the Senate have identical bills, so the language is, is the exact same uh, in, in both versions. The House passed their newborn screening bill last summer on a, a, a very strong bipartisan basis. On the Senate side, uh, we have not passed the legislation yet. Uh, this remains a priority for Senator Murray Fortunately, there is bipartisan support on the Senate for this legislation. Uh, the co-leads are Senator Hassan and Senator Wicker, uh, and there are, are bipartisan co-sponsors in addition to those two leads. On the Senate side, um, for a few years now, dating all the way back to, to almost 2018, we have been trying to overcome 
concerns among some members related to requiring informed consent for research on the newborn dried blood spots. We have been unwilling to come to agreement on a path forward, uh, which is the primary reason why this legislation has not been advanced in the Senate. That said, and Dylan mentioned this earlier, the federal government continues to fund the existing programs at HRSA, CDC, and NIH. So the programs are still functioning. We have just not been able to secure the important updates as well as this National Academy's report uh, because we have been uh, unable to move the legislation in the Senate. Uh, we continue to pursue all avenues and trying to get this over the finish line uh, and are, are actively working with Senator Burr's team. Uh, Senator Burr is the ranking member on the HELP Committee. So uh, we, we are in uh, almost weekly conversations with them on, on a path forward here um, and, and are really trying to get this over the finish line. Um, that's, that's really the latest on, on the status of the Reauthorization Act on the Senate. Uh, and I will now kick it over to Mike. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks to Everlight Foundation for uh, inviting me and giving me the opportunity to talk to you today. I want to share with you a bit of our family story uh, and why I am uh, turning myself 100% into newborn screening and what we can do as advocates uh, in this field and what does we uh, what, what do we want to achieve uh, in terms of the policy and legislative side? So, what you're seeing here is a picture from uh, more than a, uh, ten years ago uh, with two of my boys, and I have three. Um, this was taken about I think fifteen days after they both got their diagnosis of MPS2, which is a progressive neurodegenerative disease. What I wanted to show you in this picture is early diagnosis is really hard. What you're seeing is a boy on the left with you know, a, a year old, with pretty minimal, if any, symptoms. On the right, my older boy, who's almost four at the time and uh, having shown a lot of developmental delayed signs, but on a very brief interaction with him, you wouldn't notice. In fact, this has been true for our, you know, eight months exploration, in, you know, what you call a diagnostic odyssey with all the specialists and, you know, pediatricians and whatnot. And the first sign of them seeing him and the first response had generally been his language delayed because he's in a bilingual, you know, environment. And that's common for boys uh, to have language delay and all that. And so when you hear the kind of uh, uh, questions about, you know, why can't we wait until clinical diagnosis? It is because it's typically too late, especially for diseases that involve irreversible damages, like what's been happening to my boys. And this is prominent uh, throughout the course of our journey in the past uh, 10 years or so, if you can move to the next slide. My older one, when he was diagnosed, had been, you know, uh, already severely delayed. And, but the younger one, as I mentioned, had barely any symptoms. So over the next 10 years, these are all pictures of my younger one. He was able to learn how to swim, how to ride a bike. And physically for MPS2 uh, kids, as you, uh, if you interact with them, you will realize how difficult it is for any of them to be able to master these skills because they have progressively stiffening joints, making it really hard for them to move their shoulders, move their um, uh, knees, move their uh, hips to be able to physically capable of doing those. And uh, developmentally, he was able to, uh, you know, uh, I guess, develop an interest in jigsaw puzzles and he was able to do at his peak a 300 piece puzzle. And what's amazing about this is he was able to sit there for almost three hours to do it. Uh, and this is a disease that's uh, very uh, often accompanied with hyperactivity, which he does suffer from. So for him to be able to have that concentration is incredible. And all of those, if you allow me to extrapolate, I think all of those uh, extended from his 
uh, earlier recognition of the disease and earlier treatment. And so if you advance to the next slide, you will see you know, now uh, more than a decade later, uh, my old one uh, is already uh, you know, very mobility impaired and he has to be on an adaptive stroller when we go out. The younger one, while he's still developmentally challenged and has a lot of behavior issues of his own, but he's a lot more independent than his elder brother ever was. So um, what I get from that, and this is my primary motivation in getting into newborn screening, is that if we can, if we could possibly recognize their disease earlier and start the treatment earlier, we could do a lot of things in terms of saving their uh, capability of living a more independent life and then let them enjoy their lives better. Nowadays, taking my older boy out to a, a hike would be really challenging, but taking the younger one out would be you know, pretty straightforward. Um, and so the, the, the whole situation has prompted me to uh, join the advocacy effort from early on, but really more full, fully invested from 2018 when I had to step away from my full-time job and you know, partially because of the boy's escalating medical needs, uh, but partially because that will allow me to uh, put more time and effort into advocating for newborn screening, which I think holds real promise for a lot of the rare diseases out there. If you uh, uh, have been following the latest news, you would uh, probably know the latest milestone that we have uh, uh, been able to achieve uh, in newborn screening for NPS2 was that it just passed the committee vote in being recommended onto the recommended uniform screening panel. And that was a big thing, certainly for NPS2, but we also want to reflect on the challenges that we have encountered through that process. And I wanna share it with you. If you move to the next slide, um, the whole process took more than four years. So the National NPS Society and a few um, uh, passionate uh, doctors uh, have led the effort in coming together with the nomination package, which took about two years to assemble. And then it took a while to officially submit it to the committee, took about a year before it gets onto the evidence review stage and took another nine months, as we know, until a couple of weeks ago when it was voted. And then from this point on, of course, it will not be the end of the journey. It will be uh, you know, going through the official recommendation, recognition by the secretary, and then going to the implementa implementation challenges by state. Uh, and there we have you know, the great effort by Everlight Foundation to implement those state-by-state uh, -state policies that would allow any rust conditions to be automatically on a path to implementation. But, you know, still it will take a couple of years before any state starts to screen for NPS2. Uh, along the way, what we have realized is there is a lack of evidence and that's not surprising for any rare disease. And the evidence that was lacking most prominently at the time was how do you demonstrate the benefit of early diagnosis and treatment? And this is really hard. Um, what we were fortunately able to do was to uh, partner with a couple of really passionate researchers, um, including a MPS2 sibling, uh, a, a young scientist from uh, uh, Korea and others um, to document the journey my boys have gone through and being the nerd uh, uh, for me and my wife both as scientists we have kept a pretty extensive uh, log of all of their medical uh, uh, events and so that culminated into this paper we assembled the manuscript in about two months submitted it in a, uh, and got approval and mission in about uh, a month and a half and got it to print literally 10 days before the committee meeting. And it was used as evidence in a committee meeting. So I think, you know, on one side, I'm really proud of my boys. This is, I think, their best gift to the world, uh, being who they are. Um, 
And, but the other thing is, I think this whole journey shows us that even with what we have now in newborn screening system at the both you know, federal and state levels, we're still facing tremendous challenges in nominating a disease, a single disease to uh, being screened. Um, and what we know now is, you probably have heard this number already, there are hundreds more rare diseases that, are, that have an FDA approved treatments by now. Are all of those suitable for newborn screening? Probably not, but I can bet you a large fraction of those are. How do we add those potentially hundreds of diseases to the newborn screening panel in the future? Uh, with the current system, it's probably gonna take uh, more than decades, probably even centuries to add them all. So we do need a lot of changes. And uh, I think, you know, when you hear from Dr. Don Bailey next, you will hear some of those uh, uh, potentials. But what I want to uh, emphasize at this stage is what we as advocates can do. Um, so if you flip to the next slide, I think um, we as a community uh, really need to uh, come together and have all the stakeholders, you know, not just from families, but from um, researchers, clinicians, the companies, uh, the industry, the government, everyone that has a vested interest in seeing newborn screening to better success. We need to have what has been often uh, uh, mentioned as a public-private uh, uh, partnership to uh, move it forward. And this is a little plug for my uh, own effort right now, um, Project Guardian, which stands for Genomic Uniform Screening Against Rare Diseases in All Newborns. This is one form of efforts, uh, and, I, and I will count it as part of an advocacy effort. I think this is something that uh, if you have um, an interest and have the capability to do, uh, we'll definitely uh, hope to uh, hear from you to join that effort. Additional things we can do, I, I really want to highlight um, the lack of evidence for all of these rare diseases and how individuals like us can uh, uh, potentially speed it up in terms of uh, evidence collection. What we have not realized throughout the years is that you know, our boys' cases can certainly be captured as a case report. And we were relying on the fact that you know, we can do uh, oral presentations, testimonies to you know, use that storytelling to uh, uh, move it forward. But you know, in the evidence review process, it is evidence-based and there's a, a limitation as to what they can accept in that formal evidence uh, realm. And so in that regard, a printed article is a lot more, um, holds a lot more weight than storytelling, right? So I think if you have a chance to participate in that kind of effort, if you have kids or you know kids who, uh, you know, either are sibling cases like ours or are, um, you know, have a family history and got recognized early on, either prenatally or in a newborn stage and got treatments early on, and the natural course of his or her uh, disease progression has been drastically different from before. All of those, if it can be captured as um, you know, case reports, I think it will help tremendously when that particular disease is going forward to uh, being nominated and being considered. Um, so after seeing all of that, I think we also recognize how difficult uh, this journey has been. And I think there's a lot of things we can do to potentially make it better. The starting point of all of that is to get the uh, bill reauthorized because that's a foundation of all of the newborn screening work that we have in the country. We have a tremendous momentum built behind that already. I think we have a system that is very capable. And if you look at around the uh, entire world, it is definitely leading all of the uh, similar efforts in other countries to uh, follow suit. So I think that's the very first thing we want to do. And uh, thank you all for your interest in continuing to help in that course of action. And with that, I will turn it over to Don to talk about the improvements that we can potentially look for. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks to everybody for such a great um, uh, set of presentations and introducing 
uh, this particular topic. So I'm Don Bailey. I'm at RTI International. We're a large nonprofit research institute. Um, and so today I'll be describing results from a project we did on newborn screening modernization. So next slide, please. Yeah, so you will know, be focused on why do we need to modernize newborn screening? I mean, it's working pretty well, isn't it, in a lot of ways? Um, but there are a lot of challenges, and those challenges have already been mentioned by some of our speakers. And so we wanted to um, try to do a more systematic assessment of, of those uh, of potential strategies. So everybody knows that newborn screening starts with a, a dried blood spot that's collected from babies at birth. And there are a series of tests that are being done uh, to, um, to identify babies who are on the, whose condition is on the recommended uniform screening panel. But there's some upcoming changes to, um, that, are, that will dramatically affect newborn screening. And so I'm gonna be talking about those today. Next slide, please. Um, I'm just required to disclose my sources of funding. So my current active funding comes from the NIH, from CDC, from the John Merck Fund, which is a private family foundation, and from, uh, from Janssen Pharmaceuticals. Next slide, please. And the, the funders of the study that, I that I'm presenting today are for uh, pharmaceutical companies and the Every Life Foundation. So next slide, please. Well, so as you've heard already, newborn screening is facing uh, many challenges in responding to both the current state of things, but a future state of rapid changes in both technology and treatment. So we wrote about that some uh, nearly seven years ago now in, in 2015. There's a great article by Sean McCandless and Erica Wright um, in 2020, uh, talking about newborn screening in the United States and really saying that there's some existential challenges that need to be addressed and need to be addressed quickly. Uh, next slide, please. So there are really two fundamental things that I'll just mention today. And the first one is on the screening side is how to incorporate genetic testing or sequencing newborn screening. So most states um, don't, do not use, most conditions screened in newborn screening do not rely on genetic testing right now. It's testing through other methods, um, but there's a huge push right now to be thinking about either a genetic testing or potentially even whole genome sequencing in newborn screening. A lot of companies are involved with this. A lot of um, advocates would like for this to happen. And as you can see from the two articles here, you know, Cindy Powell wrote a nice paper on what genome sequencing can offer newborn screening, but there's an alternative article focusing on the ethical ha hazards and programmatic challenges of genomic newborn screening. And as I think someone put in the chat already, one of the biggest challenges is what results to return if you're doing whole genome sequencing and where would you draw the line? Next slide, please. The one we'll focus on mostly today, though, is how to prepare for a new generation um, of what we could call transformative therapies. Transformative therapies are treatments that, instead of treating a symptom, treat the core cause of a disease. And that's why they're called transformative, because they could be curative or close to curative. And we, can, we know them by several different names, and there are several different approaches, ranging from stem cell transplantation, gene therapy, cell therapy, and gene editing. These are very, very powerful uh, treatments, and there's a long pipeline of those that are in development right now. Uh, and the question is, how is newborn screening going to be prepared for that? Next slide, please. So why, why do they pose a problem for newborn screening? You would think, well, my goodness, this is a great thing. It's a great thing for children. It's a great thing for parents. It's a great thing for clinicians. Absolutely. But the problem is that newborn screening is really not prepared right now for rapid expansion of, of gene and cell therapies that must be provided early. So as you can imagine, as soon as a treatment receives FDA approval, patient advocates very naturally will want that disorder added to newborn screening. But as Mike and others have already mentioned, having an effective treatment is necessary. You gotta have a treatment, but it's not sufficient criteria. The committee that makes recommendations needs lots of other kinds of data, uh, data on, um, the screening test on the uh, who, who would be identified, um, how do you decide which children need treatment and which children don't. So there are lots of additional data that are needed. 
and states, then once the federal and state advisory committees recommend screening, they need approval and resources to actually start screening. So we're approaching, a, we're already at a, a challenging time, but we're approaching a really challenging time. And so there's an urgent need for solutions that address the essential components of newborn screening. Next slide, please. So um, our project was led by researchers, my team at RTI International, and it was supported by the consortium of funders that I mentioned earlier. And our goal was to um, systematically assess and synthesize stakeholder perspectives on preparing newborn screening for this new generation of, of therapies. So as was mentioned earlier, there are lots of different groups and individuals that have a stake in newborn screening. We invited participants from five of those groups, patient advocates, federal or state advisory boards, <clears throat> from industry, from clinical researchers, and from state newborn screening labs. When we had um, a series of surveys and what we call mixed stakeholder panel discussions to identify challenges and propose solutions. So by a mixed stakeholder panel, uh, you know, we could have had a panel that had only patient advocates on it and then another panel that only had state newborn screening lab uh, people on it, but we realized that these things need to be done in a synergistic way. So each panel had at least one representative from each of these groups. So we used those discussions and also the literature to identify solutions and organize those into five broad domains. And then we um, developed 20 solutions um, and we sent a survey out then to all the participants to rate them on um, acceptability, feasibility, sustainability, and potential effectiveness. Next slide, please. So we uh, just in the last um, eight or nine weeks, we've published two papers summarizing uh, this. The first, uh, um, the one in Green and BMC Pediatrics summarizes the discussions that happened during those stakeholder panels. And then the JAMA uh, Network Open paper uh, reported the subsequent evaluation of strategies um, by the expert based on the survey that we distributed. Those are both open access um, articles and I'd be glad to share links to those, um, but you can Google them as well. Uh, next slide, please. So here's what we, the scenario that we posed to panel participants. Assume that it's, you know, 10 years from today, of course, that would be 2032 now, but anyway, that 30 or more new transformative gene or cell therapies have been approved by the FDA to treat single gene disorders, non-cancer, rare disorders. So let's assume the following. Each one treats a different disorder, each has a valid screening assay that's not costly. The therapies are curative or significantly disease modifying if given early in life, but much less so, or even maybe not effective if given earlier. So that's why newborn screening would be needed. We don't really know the long-term risk and duration of efficacy. And for the purpose of this activity, we had to ask them to assume that the cost of therapies would be completely covered by insurance or by Medicaid. Um, otherwise, the cost would have driven the entire discussion. Uh, next slide, please. So um, first of all, we asked um, all of them how much change is needed to prepare newborn screening for new therapies. So at one end of the continuum, you have no change. At the other end, is continu you know, extensive change throughout the system. Well, you can see from this that the, vet, you know, the participants, almost uh, the vast majority of them, uh, rated an eight or a nine or 10. They said, you know, we, the, the current system, except for two people who felt like we're doing pretty well right now, the rest of the panelists felt like there was some degree of change needed, and most of them felt like extensive change uh, throughout the system. Next slide, please. So if we, we asked them in general, how should uh, those changes be made? We had two small groups. We had one, you know, 2%. Uh, of, the, of the sample said, let's keep the system as it is and make all the changes within it. On the other end of the continuum, we had a few people that said, we need to, we need to really to develop an entirely new system to conduct newborn screening. I think um, both of those are probably, probably not feasible right now, um, but it's, so it's the magnitude and the direction of change uh, that's going to be going to be needed. So um, the, the rest of the group was pretty much e evenly divided on the blue, in the blue section, these were people who said, let's keep most of the screening system as we have it, but, but develop a number of new, uh, small number of new system components. Those in green said we need to develop many new system components, keep a portion of what we have, but it really needs major retooling. 
So, you know, what we see here is not only um, from these two slides, not only strong feeling about the importance of change, but variability in how much people are willing, how far will people are willing to go in these five groups to actually make change happen. Next slide, please. So there are five domains. I'll briefly um, mention each one of those. Some of them have been uh, mentioned already, but the first domain um, had to do with revising and improving the timeliness of the recommended uniform screening panel review. Now, now this the committee that's been mentioned earlier and this the Rust really have been critical. They provided essential national guidance um, so that it increases harmonization across states for what disorders should be a part of newborn screening. But this process has been really slow. Uh, the committee has only approved before I made this slide six disorders since it was established in 2006 with the addition of MPS2 um, a couple of weeks ago. It's now seven disorders. Nonetheless, it's still very slow. You can imagine a pipeline of if, if 30 compared to, to this, 30 new disorders in 10 years as opposed to six in, uh, or seven in 12 years. It's just not a sustainable um, pace of work. So this pace of, like I said, the pace of review and approval is really unsustainable um, as we're having these rapid developments in treatments and screening methods. Next slide, please. A uh, second domain had to do with the mechanisms to offer screening for conditions in addition to those on the RUST. We really need um, pilot studies um, that are systematically conducted to, so that when disorders are getting close to be ready for newborn screening, we can test them out. Um, there are two projects that are going on right now that are, as well as some individual studies, the Screen Plus is in New York, and then our early check project in North Carolina. Both of these are screening for conditions that are not part of the recommended uniform screening panel, but designed to gather data to help inform the committee. Um, next slide, please. So this is where the problem is for the committee, and that is the lack of data. Uh, Mike can mention that and others have mentioned it as well. We've got to figure out ways to accelerate and expand data to inform policy decisions because really no one wants poor decisions. You have to make decisions based on evidence, but that evidence is really hard to get, especially for very rare diseases. We need to know the natural history. You know, how does a disease progress over time? Screening protocols, how would you identify a child with that particular disorder? A variable penetrance and predictive biomarkers would mean that some diseases, some disorders will have a mild form that will have multiple forms. Some of them that are mild and some of them are severe. Um, but how do we know at birth which child will have the mild form and who will have the severe form? Because those will ha have a big impact on the treatments that will need to be provided or whether to provide treatment. So we need data on follow-up protocols and assessment of long-term outcomes. So getting these data um, can range widely. Might give a great example of, of a sibling study that was very powerful in affecting the committee's decision. So there could be some individual studies, but we really need a national plan for coordinated pilot, pilot studies and a way to um, integrate data um, over um, across many projects. And as already been mentioned with the New Orleans Community Saves Lives Act um, renewal, um, this whole question about consented versus population samples, both in retention of dry blood spots, but also in prospective studies is a, something we really have to figure out. Next slide, please. Uh, another giant problem is the, um, is the variability and the challenge that states experience in, in expediting and uh, implementing newborn screening for new disorders. So it can take anywhere from three to six or seven years once a disorder is approved for a state to actually implement it. So this map was prepared by New Steps. This is about a year or so old now, so it needs to be updated. So the, the and because there are now 36 rust disorders, um, the, this slide, slide, the dark states, the dark green states screen for all 35 rust disorders. The lightest screen only serve for a screen for 30, although there have been some increases in that since this slide was made. But the, you know, states need a lot of things. They need authority. Someone has to give them permission to add new disorders. They need money. They need trained staff. They need equipment and they need time to ramp up. And some states are much better than this than other states. Much, you know, some of them have legislation that requires them to move quickly. Um, but there's 
even despite the harmonization that the RUSP has been providing, we do not have harmonization around the country. And there needs to be something in place to help states expedite comprehensive implementation. Next slide. So the last domain really has to do with um, evaluating emerging methods of screening and their consequences. And so, um, you know, the advent of cell and gene therapies will rely heavily on sequencing as a primary uh, screening method, whether it's genome or exome or some other form of genetic testing. The sequencing, as I've already mentioned, is controversial in the context of universal public health screening, uh, is, but, mainly not only for the technological reasons, but because of the return of results questions. The states are just not ready right now for sequencing as a tier one screening method. But we'll say that with our early check project, we are gearing up to add whole genome sequencing to our voluntary research panel. And we'll probably be um, screening for um, 100 or 150 disorders and returning results for those. We hope to launch that in um, either, either at the end of this year or early next year to help inform um, these questions. Next slide. So the top rated solutions by the experts, um, you know, more than 85% of the people rating them as, as, as being effective. Um, established mechanisms for cross-state data coordination. There's very little, uh, um, there's no requirements for states to share data except for at a very high level of, of certain variables. But we need to do cross-state data coordination, not only for the rust disorders, but for, for projects that are on pilot studies that are ongoing. Um, uh, an important suggestion is to create a network of regional screening labs. This, these would not be labs that would you know, take over all screening for states, but would really help states um, start screening faster if the technology is the barrier. So um, the screening, the regional labs could actually screen, um, you know, the states could send dry blood spots to those labs um, until they're ready uh, for, for screening in their own state. We need to align programs across federal agencies. As has been mentioned, there are multiple federal agencies that are responsible for newborn screening, various aspects of newborn screening. Those programs need to be aligned and systematically integrated with each other. And of course, everyone wants more money. We need more money for research. We need more money for federal funding to states. Um, and we need to build this national capacity for, um, for sequencing and genetic testing. <clears throat> Last slide, please. So in, in conclusion, pretty much what I've said already, new treatments could lead to better outcomes only if they start very early. Newborn screening is really the only way to make sure that happens. It's the only way to assure equitable, universal access to pre-symptomatic treatments. It's a great thing that we're having these new treatments coming along, but this will be a disruptive force and newborn screening really isn't ready for them. So this is the first study identified and where we identified five areas of change and some solutions. But this is only really the first step. As we've talked about earlier, newborn screening is really a loosely interconnected state-based state system with many different stakeholders. And so money alone is not going to solve the problem. We've got to prepare the system with strategic planning, objective research, collaboration, and funding. And I think the next slide just has my contact information on it. Um, yeah. So you can email me at dbailey at rti.org if you have any questions. Um, and I'll turn it over now to the organizers for a question and answer period. Thanks very much. Awesome. Thank you, Don, for such a thorough walkthrough of the modernization. Uh, to Mike, I know I messaged you privately. I really appreciate the walkthrough and your uh, family story as well as the work you did on the RASP application. I was stunned to hear the thousands and thousands of hours uh, that went into that. Garrett, thank you for the walkthrough on the Newborn Screening National Academy. Um, I know we only have five minutes left, so I'm going to ask Dylan uh, two questions. And if folks have additional questions, if you put them in the Q&A, hopefully we can get to them after the fact. Um, so Dylan, I'm hoping you can address what happens if the reauthorization does not pass, as well as some of the comments that have been happening about dried blood spots. And then you can close us with the code for today, and we'll be done in five. All right, uh, so I'll start first uh, with uh, what happens if it doesn't pass? Uh, and so I, I saw some comments in the chat in terms of have the programs expired? Uh, and that is technically correct uh, with the reauthorization not having passed, uh, the statute has expired. However, uh, appropriators are still funding the programs. Uh, and so in reality, 
um, these programs are, are still functioning uh, as they were back in 2019. Uh, however, without passage, we are also seeing issues uh, in the fact that the improvements that we need that uh, Gary and I both highlighted are not being implemented. Uh, and so that's an important distinction where uh, the program is still running uh, at the 2019 status uh, while we need to be running at the 2022 status. Uh, and so we need the important updates within the reauthorization to be implemented. Uh, in terms of the informed consent amendment, uh, I know there are a lot of questions around that. Um, I would start with saying that first, again, these are de-identified biospecimen. Uh, and so the, the main concern that has been raised by Senator Paul and his team is around privacy. However, we believe uh, that that is an issue because these are de-identified biospecimen. Uh, and so in implementing the informed consent uh, is a taxing process. Uh, it can take a long time. And, and Senator Paul's amendment uh, would, would require informed consent uh, within six months, and it would shut down new training research. Uh, and it's important to note that there's really two parts of that. First is that it would inhibit the ability to conduct research around adding new conditions. So helping to develop new screening tests, helping to develop new therapies. Uh, that all comes out of these uh, dry blood spots. Uh, in addition, uh, the dry blood spots are also used to help with quality service. Uh, and so that is going to impact the ability to test conditions today. Um, they are used to make sure the machines are working properly uh, and that they are telling us what we expect them to be telling. Uh, and, and the loss of these dry blood spots uh, would really inhibit that ability. And so this amendment would not only impact the future, but it also impact the today of newborn screening. Um, and so that is really the main area. I know uh, there have been a lot of questions in there and hopefully I tried to give some broad answers uh, to be able to answer them. Um, but again, if, if you do have any questions, uh, please do not hesitate uh, to reach out. Uh, I know you can reach out to me on the Event Mobi platform. Uh, I'd be happy to answer additional questions. Uh, we also have the one pager, which does help to address uh, some of these concerns, uh, as well as uh, on our website, we do have a little more uh, in-depth section around the informed consent amendment, um, what exactly it is uh, and the impacts uh, that it has. Uh, and now we are moving into our breakout sessions. Uh, and so if you are with AR and are a young adult uh, and, and want to go there, you can go to the young adult advocacy session. Uh, and for those who want to discuss legislative hot topics, uh, we'll be discussing uh, some of the other legislative asks that we haven't had the opportunity to go into uh, in our deep dive sessions uh, in the other breakout session. Uh, and those are starting at two o'clock. Uh, and so those will be starting in six minutes. So everybody can go take a quick break uh, and hope to see many of you, many of you there soon. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm looking forward to it.